Sydney Baptist Church to our online service. It's so good that even though we are all at our own homes, uh, we can still come together and watch the service as a church family. Now I invite you to stand wherever you are uh, to sing and praise our glorious Father. than anything in this world you alone are all i want and everything you are good i stand in awe of all that you are Good morning, church. I hope this finds you keeping on keeping on. We had a great night uh, on Thursday night at our um, church fun Zoom hour and uh, had a lot of laughs and and the creativity of uh, of people was something to be to behold. Uh, but it was just so nice to connect with others, a whole bunch of us that came on there and really appreciate Gary and Wilma for organising that time. Uh, it was good just to being community, sharing together. Just to, to note that in a short while, I'm going to lead us around the Lord's table in communion. So if you just want to grab um, some bread and some juice, and we can participate together in just a little while. Also, I uh, want to mention uh, congratulations to uh, Joel Manning and Catherine Braid, who were engaged last week. So, so good to hear your news. We celebrate with you for your future ahead. We are also looking forward to hearing from Pastor James as he continues the second message on the Apostle Paul in a short while as well. Now I'm just going to go into a time of prayer. Let's pray. 
Our Father and our God, we want to thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are the God who is above all and in all and through all. And we thank you that uh, we can look to you, whether it's uh, sunshine, rain or hail, uh, we can see that you are at work in every season. Lord, we just want to come before you today and bring to you those amongst us who are struggling. We pray for those with health issues. I pray that you would bring your healing hand upon them. I pray for those that uh, perhaps are struggling um, in mental health. We pray, Lord, that you would be helping provide them with um, yeah, just comfort and hope and also uh, just people they can talk to and, and share with. Lord, we, uh, we also want to uh, bring before you today our gifts and tithes and offerings. Lord, it all belongs to you. And in challenging times, it, it is um, a challenge for us to not just be protective about what we can hold on to, but to keep that kingdom of God generosity. And I pray that you would help us to continue to be faithful because you are such a faithful God. So as we gave online during the week, uh, or depositing into banks or however we did it, I pray, Lord, that you would take all of that as an offering, as a worshipful offering to honour and respect you as our God and our place that you'd put us in as part of this church family at Sydenham. Lord, we want to commit that and give that to you <clears throat> in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now in preparing for communion, we are going to uh, be led by a, by a worship song. So let's just participate with that. Let's sing, O oh Lord. Oh Lord, you searched me And you know my way Even when I fail I bow my knee where your blood was shed for me there's no greater love than this you have overcome the grave your glory fills the highest place what can separate me
from my eyes and you stand before me I know you love me and I know you love me and at the cross I bow my knee where your blood was shed for me there's no greater love than this and you have overcome the grave your glory fills the highest place what can separate me now Let's sing again at the cross at the cross I bow my knee Where your blood was shed for me There's no greater love than this You have overcome the grave Your glory fills the highest place What can separate me now? So today we come around the table and we come to remember what Jesus did. And in preparing for this, I was having a think about the, the word preparation. Uh, Pastor James mentioned it in uh, his message last week on the first part of Paul, the, the role of preparation that God had with Paul. <clears throat> and I was thinking about Jesus as well. And it's um, it always amazes me to think that Jesus was here approximately 33 years on earth and 30 of those 33 years was in preparation. And it was, it was all leading up to this time when he would go to the cross and pay the price and then be resurrected and point the way to a whole new hope. And, and really when we come around the Lord's table, it's a time when we can be reminded of, of our spiritual preparation, of being, of acknowledging that God is at work and that God is often working in our preparation, whether it's preparation of our character or preparation of our work or preparation of our futures or preparation around the ministry, around what God has for the church. And as we come around the table then, uh, we remember that Jesus had had all that time of preparation and then launched into his three years of ministry and then it culminates here at the table and even here Jesus is preparing his disciples right before he goes to the cross as we take up our bread we remember that Jesus said as it's recorded in the Gospels he said take this bread and remember me this is my body let's eat the bread together now As we ate that bread, we were sharing together, not in person, but through this medium, we've been able to, as a whole church family, gather around sharing in our remembrance of the Lord, giving up his life, as is demonstrated by the breaking of the bread. And then he took a cup and he said, take this and drink it. And as you do, Remember me, for this is the covenant of the new kingdom. Drink. Jesus was announcing that by his blood, it would open wide a whole new way of living according to the kingdom of God. Let's drink. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you did for us on the cross. What sacrifice. Though perfect, you allowed yourself to be fully human and you embraced the suffering, the pain, the indignities, the punishment, the torture, 
and ultimately death. And you did it so that we might believe and have life and life eternal. We are so, so grateful, Lord, for what you did for us and that you opened the way to a new life in you. Receive for us, from us right now all those things that we would want to confess to you that have not been according to your ways, the thoughts, the attitudes, the behaviours that have fallen short of the glory of God. We give them to you now and know that you are faithful and just to forgive those who have confessed. And as we do that, we recognise it's because of your blood and the breaking of your body that we have been forgiven. We are grateful. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to hear from Pastor James on his second message of the Apostle Paul. And then straight after that, we're going to go into our discussion groups with, life, with our life groups in Zoom. God bless. Well, good morning, church, and welcome back to my living room, where I wish I could offer you a cup of tea, but unfortunately I can't. You'll just have to imagine that one. Hey, we are picking up right where we left off from last week as we continue our series, Lessons from the New Testament, a series called People Like Us. Hey, if you're, if you're new, welcome, first of all. It's so great to have you join us online. We're excited to have you. Um, we would love to get to know you, in fact, so please reach out and get in touch and it'll be great to meet you when we finally can get back together and, and meet as a church family. Hey, the last two weeks now, we've been going through this series and um, this is part two of two as we've been unpacking the life of Paul, the Apostle. And last week, what we did is we focused on a particular question around Paul's life. We asked, what was it about this ordinary man that allowed him to be used so extraordinarily by God? And last week, we, in part one, we studied the life of young Paul when he was known as Saul of Tarsus as a boy and a young man. We looked at the context that he grew up, his family life. We looked at his education, his worldview. We read of his early persecution of Jesus followers and we talked about his transformation experience that he had on the road to Damascus, followed by this intense time in the desert um, where Jesus revealed this gospel to him. And then following that, um, the first taste of, of preaching and sharing this good news to the cities of Damascus and only a short time in Jerusalem. As we did that, we asked ourselves, who is this guy, Saul? And what can you and I today learn from this man's character? We first discussed Saul's passion, his zeal for life. And we discovered that God, in fact, wants to use passionate people. But our passions, they have to be aligned with God's purpose in the world, or they do more harm than good. Exactly what was happening in Saul's story. We then honed in on Saul's preparation and the way that God used a period of time of isolation in the desert, followed by a long period of time of 10 years in Saul's life where it felt like maybe nothing was happening. But under the surface, God was preparing Paul for something greater. And we talked about what an incredible opportunity you and I have right now to use this time to be prepared for something extraordinary that God wants to use us for in the future. And that thing for Paul was that after 10 years, Barnabas came to Tarsus where he was living and invited him to be a leader of the biggest church or the biggest Jesus following movement that was happening in the world in a city called Antioch. And Paul accepted and went with him. Already a very impressive life. Hey, but God was certainly not finished yet with Paul. He has a lot left to go. So this week, we continue Paul's story, and we continue to ask the exact same question. What was it about this ordinary man that allowed God to use him so extraordinarily? But now that we've focused on this man's character, let's take a look at Paul's 
ministry and ask what was it about the way Paul conducted his ministry that made it so successful and so extraordinary. I mean, directly or indirectly, this man's fingerprint is on the salvation of millions and millions of people throughout history. What a legacy that was. God truly used this ordinary man extraordinarily. See, Paul's mission while he was alive was simple. It was to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. It was to be part of God's redemptive story of restoring creation. And it was to bring others into that story as well, so that they could experience the freedom, the joy, and the intimacy that's available right now through Jesus. And guess what? That calling is the exact same that you and I have on our lives right now. The same calling that Paul had on his life 2,000 years ago. So what can we learn from Paul in the way that he went about fulfilling that calling, doing his ministry? What can we learn about the way he interacted with the people in his world? The way that he went about his ministry and, and conducting himself that made it so successful in achieving this calling that's placed on his life and ours. Or in essence, how can God use us extraordinarily, as he did Paul, in our worlds, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our sporting clubs, in our communities? Because these are our mission fields that have been given to us to fulfill that calling, that joint calling that we both have on our lives. So before we dive into that, let's just spend a moment in prayer together. Hey? Father God, we come before you today or whenever we're watching this, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through the life of Paul, that you would be teaching us how to fulfill this calling on our lives of, of bringing heaven to earth, of bringing people into your redemptive story so that they can experience grace and freedom and purpose, Lord. Lord, show us in our lives where our mission fields are and show us how to be interacting with those mission fields, with the people in our community to be best serving your purpose. Thank you, Father. Your name. Amen. Well, last week we worked through four chapters of Acts as we um, went through and walked through the life of Paul. But there are 16 chapters of Paul's story still to go in Acts. So today we're going to need to pick up the pace a little bit. We're going to move a little bit quicker through the narrative of Paul's life and we're going to be using broad strokes across his ministry life in general, in particular his first two mission trips. And what we're going to do is unpack some key stories, some key themes in the, that happened in those mission trips that we can apply into our context, into our mission fields that will make our calling so successful. So let's pick, off, let's pick up where we left off with Saul, who's just been appointed the leader and teacher of the biggest church in the world at the time in Antioch. So Acts 13, 1 to 3 says, Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So Paul is being called into this mega church, right? This, for the last two years, it's been the place to be if you're a Jesus follower. There's heaps of people like you and not like you that are all joining in this one place. It's a really exciting thing that's happened and Paul's in this leadership leadership position that he would have never dreamed of being part of. But right here at the start, before Paul even takes one step onto a boat or, or rides his first donkey or takes his first step on the road to another city, we see the most important factor that makes Paul's ministry so successful over the course of his life. Right from the beginning, Paul listened to the Holy Spirit. See, through worship, prayer, and fasting with his community, Paul listened and he knew the voice of God, of the Spirit. And he knew that prompting 
of the Holy Spirit to know which direction to take. See, this new community of believers that is now part of, it's made up of so many different people across the world. And I can only imagine the differences in opinions and thoughts throughout this um, melting pot of believers. But through prayer and fasting, they unanimously come to the decision of allowing two of their leaders to leave them for an undetermined amount of time. A decision that I think to come to unanimously must have been difficult, but it also must have meant that they were so sure of the voice of the Spirit. They knew his voice. So I know that this seems like an obvious point to make right at the start of Paul's journeys. But sometimes the most obvious points are the ones that we need to hear the most often. Do we know the voice, the prompting of the Spirit? How often are we intentionally learning to listen, spending time listening to that voice? When was the last time you asked God for direction? See, I know how easy it is if I'm going through the rhythms of my life. Just cruising along, it's easy to forget to listen. If I'm passionate about something, a new ministry or a new way to connect people or or something that I just want to, I'm excited to sink my teeth into, to just dive into, it's easy to forget to listen. Or on the other hand, if I'm comfortable where I'm at, you know, and things seem to be going really well, it's easy to forget to listen. Or I might anticipate that I'm going to hear something I don't like. So it's easy to intentionally not listen. But we need to continually be asking ourselves, are we regularly through prayer, worship and fasting? Are we listening to the voice of the Spirit? Are we listening for direction? See, Paul pursued, knew and listened to the Spirit. And if we are to be used extraordinarily by God in our lives, in the people's lives that are around us, in our mission fields of communities, then we need to start to listen like Paul did as well. So back to Paul's story. eh? The church in Antioch, after prayer and fasting, agreed to send Barnabas and Saul with a helper, John Mark, on their first mission trip. And we can read of this mission trip in Acts chapters 13 and 14. It's thought to be around um, the years AD 47 to 48. And as we read these two chapters, we begin to see a pattern emerge as Paul visits city to city, town to town. And every time he rocks up in a new place, the same thing happens. Upon arrival, he and his party head straight to the Jewish synagogue where they proclaim the good news. And remember that Paul's education, the fact that he has studied under this famous rabbi Gamaliel, this would attract a crowd. This would attract people to hear what he has to say. And again, we see Paul's passion for his people being used and being aligned with God's purpose this time. And we see the incredible way that God has prepared Paul for this exact calling. Isn't that cool? Inevitably, every time Paul preaches in a new city, the results are mixed. Some Jews and Gentiles alike, through the Spirit, believe, and they begin to meet together, study scripture, and become followers of the way. And then Paul spends varying amounts of time with these groups, depending on the city that he's in, in building these people up, teaching them, ultimately bringing people together, building people up and giving glory to God. So it can either go that way when people hear Paul preach, or it goes the other way, the complete opposite. People are so offended by Paul's message of good news, just as Saul was himself as a young man that they are out for blood, literally. And they start to create opposition, which eventually forces Paul to leave or be killed. In this pattern, Paul and his companions go first from Antioch to Cyprus, where we read this awesome story of Paul encountering a Jewish sorcerer, which leads to the conversion of a Roman proconsul, which leads to Paul changing his name from Saul to Paul. It's a 
great story. I'd encourage you to check it out in Acts chapter 13, 4 to 12. But following this episode in Cyprus, we learn later that Paul wanted to go from there straight to Rome, straight to the middle of civilization, straight to Caesar himself to declare this good news that he has in his heart. But the Spirit intervenes. And they end up quite off course, from Paul's intention at least, into the backwater city of Pisidian Antioch in this region called Galatia. This is another perfect example of Paul listening to the Spirit. Upon arrival, this familiar pattern continues through Pisidian Antioch, straight to the synagogue. Some people believe, other people don't. Opposition arises. Paul and Barnabas are forced out of the city. Off to the next city of Iconium. The same pattern again. Then the city of Lystra. And let's slow down here just briefly. We find in Acts 14, 8 to 12. The story of, of Paul preaching to this big crowd, presumably at the synagogue. And he sees a man who has been lame since birth and sees that he has faith to be healed. So in front of everyone, he calls for him to stand up and heals him right then and there. Well, the crowd go crazy and it has the exact opposite effect of what Paul was intending. The crowd decide that he and Barnabas must be gods come down from earth themselves. And word gets out that two gods are visiting the city and more and more people join the crowd until the whole city is in an uproar, trying to sacrifice bulls, give gifts and wreaths to Paul and to Barnabas themselves, who are desperately trying to quiet the crowd and yell, hey guys, we are just people like you. The whole thing gets outrageously out of hand. And then what we're told is some Jews who had been rubbed the wrong way and who were out for blood from the two cities previously Paul and Barnabas had visited. They get amongst the, the crowd and turn the crowd into an angry mob against Paul and Barnabas. And before Paul can escape, they stone him and drag his body outside the city, thinking that he is dead. I mean, the opposition that they'd been facing, that they'd been stirring up in these last few towns has now come back to bite them. The threat of violence has become a reality. But I love the next line. In verse 20, it says, But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. He got up after being stoned himself thinking that he was going to die, others thinking he was dead, and walked straight back into the city. I think this story highlights to me one of the main reasons that Paul's ministries were so successful. And that's that Paul was persistent despite opposition. See, Paul never gave up when he came across opposition. He never gave up when he came across people who disagreed with him, slandered him, plotted to kill him, flogged him, stoned him, imprisoned him. He continued to persist in the calling that he knew was the one thing that mattered. And trouble followed Paul everywhere he went. In fact, he begins to expect opposition everywhere he goes because he knows, having been on the other side of the message that he is preaching, as a young man out for blood, that what he is saying is countercultural. It's destabilizing to the world around him. It's dangerous stuff. And the thing is, is that the gospel that Paul was sharing then is the same that we, you and I, should be sharing today. It hasn't changed in 2000 years. And therefore, we can also expect opposition. See, the gospel is destabilizing in our world as well. It's countercultural in every way. See, it strips our culture of the idols of wealth, sex, power, and self-glorification and, and flips the narrative of building ourselves up on its head to be building others up instead. See, when the gospel is heard, people's very identities and values that they've worked their whole lives to achieve of earning wealth, of earning power, these things are threatened and people can be left feeling vulnerable, ashamed, and they inevitably let, lash out. I mean, you're essentially telling people with the gospel that the identity, the things you've been working towards, all those things mean nothing. 
you've had it wrong this whole time. There's good news, but they often just hear the bad bit. The gospel is destabilizing. It's countercultural. Therefore, of course, we can expect opposition in our own lives. In fact, if we go about our ministries, if we go about our lives in our mission fields of our schools and our communities and our workplaces, and if we do not face any opposition, we may need to ask ourselves, why? We need to make sure it's not because we are compromising to appease or avoid conflict. So do you experience opposition? I wonder if you've ever thought of that as actually a good thing. What is your reaction when you come up against it? I mean, if I was forced out of every city that I visited because I was literally afraid for my life, And then I was actually stoned, beaten, and bloodied, and bruised. I would imagine that it would be so tempting for me to give up. You know, I would throw in the towel or compromise on the message that I'm sharing to appease others because simply the cost is too high. But for Paul, the cost was never too high. And skipping ahead later in Paul's life, at the conclusion of a lot of his ministries, when he's on his way to Jerusalem, knowing he's going to be arrested. We hear these words. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. What an incredible attitude and persistence despite opposition. And after leaving the city of Lystra bloodied and bruised, Acts 14, 21 to 23 says, they then preached the gospel in Derby and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, the same city that just stoned him. He strengthened the disciples there and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. And he said, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. He said, see, Paul did not give up despite great opposition. In fact, he expected it, he embraced it, and he persisted through it. And to be used extraordinarily in our worlds, in our missional areas, in our ministries, we should do the same. We cannot give up despite great opposition. In fact, we should expect it, embrace it, and persist through it. So are you experiencing opposition at the moment? Should you be? Where is God calling you to be persistent despite opposition? So at this point, after strengthening the believers in the towns that they had previously passed through, the party then returns to Antioch, their home base, and that concludes Paul's first mission trip. And unfortunately, when he gets home, things are not how they left it, and there is great conflict amongst the church and the wider Christian community about how the Gentiles fit in to this new movement. What does it mean for them? We read that story in Acts 15 as Paul and Barnabas head down to Jerusalem to settle this dispute. And there's so many good lessons um, here as well. But I'd encourage you to go and unpack it yourself because we want to focus on Paul's second mission trip as we continue on this journey. So let's read um, and pick up from Acts 15 verse 36 to 40, which is the beginning of mission trip number two, which is thought to be around late AD 49 to 51. And this trip gets off to a very shaky start straight away. Right from the beginning, Paul and Barnabas have a vicious disagreement about who should be on the trip, a disagreement that Paul regrets vehemently later on in life. But both end up having such a sharp disagreement that they part ways. Barnabas goes to Cyprus with Mark and Paul takes Silas with him back to the region of Galatia where they'd just been to strengthen the churches that they were in on their first trip. So Paul and Silas head off to Derby, then to Lystra, again, 
where this op- great opposition was, where Paul was stoned himself. They head through Iconium, back to Pisidian Antioch, and Timothy at this point joins the party. See, all places that they have been so far have been places that they visited last on their last trip with the intention of strengthening the disciples along the way. But from this point on, things get a little bit murky. In Acts 16, 6 to 9 is where we pick up the story. It says, Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. Again here we see Paul listening and the importance of asking and listening for direction, even when it's not something that you want to hear. But more than that, the next thing that that made Paul's ministry so successful is that Paul is obedient even when he does not understand. See, the only divine guidance that Paul and Silas are given at this point is negative. Not this way, not that way. They go north, then they try to go west, but the Spirit forbids them. Then they go to the province of Asia, and they try to go up to the Black Sea area, but again, the Spirit does not permit them to go there. And it only takes two verses for Luke to describe this chain of events, but the areas that Paul and Silas and Timothy are covering are vast, and it would have taken them weeks of wandering without direction, with confusion of only knowing where they can't go, of only seeing closed doors. How frustrating and discouraging this must have been for them without this clear sense of direction. And man, this this story, this situation really hits home to me at the moment. A season of doors closing and uncertainty about what is next, wandering around unsure. A season of frustration and, and discouragement sometimes. I'm sure you can feel this sense as well in this current climate. But could it be that God has a reason, a purpose in guiding us this way? As it forces us to trust even when we don't understand. And it gives us an opportunity to live by faith. An opportunity for God to prepare us for the next thing without us knowing what that next thing is. See, Paul and Silas went through a period of time of uncertainty, discouragement, frustration, not knowing for weeks where they were meant to go. But they continued to listen, to persist and to obey. And God then directed them and used them extraordinarily. And maybe you're feeling similarly in this season. But let me encourage you that the only way out of it is to do exactly as Paul and Silas and Timothy did. Regardless of our frustrations, we need to listen, we need to persist, we need to obey even when we don't understand. And finally, at the right time, as God does next with Paul and Silas, he gives direction. He shows what's next. That's what he does now for Paul in a dream, which we read about in Acts chapter 16, 9 to 10. says this, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Finally, some clear direction, hey? So Paul, Silas, Timothy, and now Luke, the author of the book that we're going through of Acts, who's just joined the party, travel into Macedonia to the city of Philippi where, surprise, surprise, the same pattern continues. Paul seeks out a place of prayer in absence, in the absence of a Jewish synagogue where he starts to preach. Some people listen and believe, including a woman named Lydia. And of course, some people do not and are offended and cause opposition and trouble soon arises. And that trouble in this case 
is um, big. <laughs> it's big trouble for Paul in this city of Philippi. In this case, Paul is flogged publicly and thrown into prison for enraging a slave girl's owner by driving out a demon from this girl, which meant she could no longer tell the future and therefore could not earn income for her masters. Again, another epic story. No wonder there's movies made about this man's life. And I'd encourage you to read about it in Acts chapter 6. Let's pick up the story with Paul and Silas who are now sitting after being beaten and bruised. They're now sitting in prison. Acts 16, 25 to 35. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. This story is incredible. It's an amazing illustration of something that Paul did continuously throughout his ministry, throughout his life, which time and time again was used to extraordinary effect. That's that Paul saw trial as opportunity. See, Paul's ministry is full of trials. Like we said, everywhere he goes, he brings trouble with him. And in the midst of them, he continually turns to God, just as in this story. I mean, singing hymns of praise after unjustly being thrown into prison and beaten. I don't think singing hymns would be my immediate reaction. It would be very easy to be resentful, to be exhausted, to be frustrated and to be angry. But Paul was an ordinary guy like you and I, and I'm sure he was tempted in the same way, to lash out in the same way, but instead he chose to sing. He sang, I'm sure not because he felt like singing. I'm sure it probably hurt to sing in the state he was in, but he sang to remind himself and to declare that God is in control no matter what situation or trial he is in. And that he believed that God could turn even this situation for good and for his kingdom. He's saying to turn this trial into an opportunity. And look at what happens next day. God changes this trial into a triumph. And we see this consistently in Paul's story. From the stoning at Lystra to this imprisonment at Philippi to the incoming shipwreck in Malta, when Paul sees trial, turns to God and turns it into opportunity, God inevitably turns that trial into a trial. So whether we come across physical suffering like Paul in this story or any trial in life, whether it is fear, anxieties, traumas, loss, illness, whatever it is, when we go to God and treat trial as opportunity, God turns it into triumph. And this is challenging for me. I know there are often trials, big and small, in my life. And I can testify, that even in, in my story, that when I have turned to God through trial and treated it as an opportunity, that trial has become a triumph for God's glory for God's kingdom. So how do we view trials in our own life? Do we view them as opportunities? What's our reaction to trials? Are we singing, 
praise? Are we turning to God? I mean, all of us are experiencing a trial right now. What's our reaction to this? Are we praising? Are we turning to God? Are we asking God to turn this into an opportunity and to then turn it into a triumph? Because God will if we give him the chance. So good, hey? Well, Paul's ministry doesn't end there. He continues to listen to the Spirit. He continues to persist despite opposition. He continues to obey without understanding. And he continues to turn trials into opportunities. And God then plays his part. And he turns those opportunities of, tr- of trials, things like riots and imprisonments, things like court trials and assassination attempts, things like shipwrecks and snake bites, into the triumph of salvation for high-ranking Roman officials, for kings and queens, for island natives, for sailors, for prisoners, and many others. The, The triumph of salvation and the presentation of the gospel to these people. Paul found himself in a trial. He turned it into opportunity, and God turned it into a triumph. This is how Paul, an ordinary man, was used in extraordinary ways. This is why his ministry was so successful. And if we want God to use us extraordinarily in our lives, in our mission fields, in our missions, then we need to do the same. We need to be like this ordinary man, Paul. We need to be passionate people who are aligned with God's purpose. We need to be prepared We need to listen to the Spirit. We need to expect and persist through opposition. We need to obey regardless of understanding. And we need to see trial as opportunity. If we do these things, I can't wait to see how God will do extraordinary things in our lives for the people around us in our mission fields. Let's pray. Father God, we want just that, God. We want to we want in our mission fields to to bring people into your kingdom, God. We want to live lives that are not just pleasing to you, but are fulfilling the calling that you've placed on our lives, God. To spread your gospel, spread your good news, God. Lord, to do that, I, I pray that you would be just convicting us of the areas that we need to shift like this ordinary man Paul did. Lord, please be be helping us to unpack this story and applying it to our context in our lives so that we can have the greatest effect, so that we can be used extraordinarily, God, so that we can bring your kingdom of heaven to earth. Lord, we thank you, God. In your name, amen. Why don't you join us? as we finish our service with some worship.
We are praying for you guys as a, as a pastoral team and, and we're, we're praying a blessing over you this week. And we pray that the things that we've talked about today, um, that, that they would be impacting for you, that they would be challenging you. We're praying that you would be determining where your mission fields are in your lives and that the story of Paul would be transforming the way that you interact with others around you. So as God does his work, we pray that you have the boldness and confidence to do your work for him in fulfilling that calling as well. That's all from us. Have a blessed week.